first off, we have to discuss what section we're talking about. So I'm talking about the macro level. So chairs and desks and objects, not the little microscopic electrons that behave completely differently. And within metaphysics, there's many views to choose from. I'm, I found that idealism represents or answers the question the best. For me, I broke down the word to almost an elementary level, that way I could understand it. And I saw that the word idea is in the word idealism. So my own interpretation is that reality is based in our ideas, or that reality is conceptualized by our own thoughts. So that means that this room, or the desks you're sitting in, they're there because you think they're there. Um, or if anybody has a book by their bedside table, that's there because you think it is there. And this goes off the part of leaving your, the room and what happens when you leave the room. So let's take that book. When you go to bed, it's there. When you wake up in the morning, it's in the same spot. When you leave for school, it's still there. When you come home from school, it's still on your table. But what about when you're not home? What about when you're not observing it? Now, if anybody has animals, I know my cat would probably be observing it. But is it still on my desk? Is it still real? And in idealism, contrives that it might not be. It could, it's not saying that it, it's not there, but there's a possibility that that book is no longer on the table. And this leaves a lot of room for interpretation. So as you can see from this fiction, the man saying a table, and the woman saying that's your reality, not mine. So I know in class we see Creed sit on the table a lot, so maybe he sees tables as chairs, I don't know. <laughs> but the thing is, since this is up to our interpretation, idealism leaves us to our own devices to interpret what we think something is. So that means our preconceived ideas as to what things are, like this is a large podium or whatever you want to call it. We put names on it because we think that's what it should be called. Also, within that, you have, I'm using determinism and free will to back up my point, but I like the, the saying, it says, life is like a game of bridge. The hand you are dealt with represents determinism the way you play it is free will. So determinism states that our lives, they're preset. We don't have choices over what happens in our lives. We don't, like everything that happens is already set upon. So the past controls the present, which controls the future. And since we have no control over the past, we do not control the present we are in right now. And since we don't control this present, we don't control the future. And with my analogy before, that, like the card game, you don't have control over what hand you're dealt. You just don't. The dealer gives it to you and you don't have control over that. But then with free will, which you have the power to choose your own path, you, there's nothing preset, you are the one making the choices, you're choosing how you're using those cards in the game. Now between those is self-determinism, so that's why you can find almost a happy medium. There's two forms of self-determinism, passive and active. Passive says that there's like a set number of choices. So with this picture, there's three doors there. There's a red one, an orange one, and a blue one, and he has a key to open them. He doesn't have a choice over how many are there. He, there's three, and he gets to choose. So it makes you feel like you have free will, but at the same time, you don't have power over how many choices you have. Or active, you do. Active self-determinism, the number of choices that you can be given can fluctuate based on how the observer, that person, their input into the situation. So let's say you get some food to eat. You could go into a room, there's a chair. You could sit down in the chair and eat. You could eat while standing. You can eat while sitting on the floor. But let's say you're in a room and there are no chairs. Now you can only eat while standing or eat while on the floor. So by going to that different room, by changing your scenario, your surroundings, you've now actively eliminated a choice. With that, there's causality, and this whole thing together. There's a chain of cause and effect. So a cause equals an effect, which becomes a cause, which equals another effect, and so on and so forth. Now, in the actual world, most of the time, it's not a linear path like that. So 
one cause can equal many effects, such as a hurricane. So Sandy came through. That when there was flooding, there was house damage, cars got destroyed, we lost electricity, we didn't go to school. And then on the other side, many causes can equal one effect. So let's say a car accident. If it's raining and that mixes with the oils on the road and the car loses, the person driving loses control and there's bad tires and there's a tree that happens to be in that new trajectory of the car, it equals one car accident. Now, just like yin and yang, there's two parts to things. On the other side of idealism, there's realism or materialism. And I don't agree with this, but uh, re materialism says that reality is based in the physical world. So if you all like, would grab onto your desk and just see that that's there. That's physically there and not moving it. That's, that's what materialism says, that these physical objects, that's what reality is. And materialism is a strong supporter of determinism and straight determinism, which would throw out my idea of causality because if everything is predetermined already, then those cause and effects become irrelevant. They're not important anymore. And more importantly, if you didn't cause anything, if you, those cause and effects aren't by your own devices, then everything's out of your control. Or that would be the argument. And that's my biggest problem with materialism, is that you can say, I was determined to do something. So let's say somebody cheats on a test, a student cheats on a test, and the teacher catches them. The teacher, the student might say, oh, I was determined to do that. There was nothing in my control. And I can tell you from my past teachers, I'm sure Professor Gerken would agree, that wouldn't work. That student would probably fail. And the problem is that can be heightened. That could go to stealing, that could go to lying, that could even go to killing somebody. You can say, I was determined to kill that person. So finally, because causality supports both active and passive self-determinism, and I'll give you an example of that a cause would be that my parents wanted a child, and the effect is that I was born and I happen to be a female. Now, through cause and effect of my life, I have decided to join the military. The, through act, passive self-determinism, I don't get to choose to be special forces because I'm a female. But through active self-determinism, by the cause and effect of going to school and possibly getting good grades, by going to camp, doing well there. Again, that's active self-determinism. I can choose a branch that I want to go into within the Army. So, and this ties into idealism because if I have this active and passive self-determinism and this power to choose, then these are my ideas to choose them. These classes are only as hard as I think they are. Those obstacles are only there because I believe they are, not believe, but because my idea, my conceptualization is that they're there. And also another, what really happens when we leave that room from the first slide. Materialism would say that everything stays the same, that there is no change, but how are we positive? Where idealism has a stronger point saying we don't know what actually happens. Um, and finally, philosophy will always leave us questioning, we know that. We answer questions with more questions. And materialism kind of cuts us off and doesn't let us expand on those new questions where idealism does.